Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this presentation of New America. Uh, my name is Josh Keating. I'm a journalist at Slate, and uh, I'm speaking today with Hao Wu, who's an award-winning documentarian and filmmaker. Uh, he originally trained as a molecular biologist and then uh, began his career in the internet industry, working in both Silicon Valley and in China. Uh, since he's transitioned to filmmaking, he's produced and directed a series of uh, really incredible films about uh, transformations in Chinese society. Uh, those include Beijing or Bust, The Road to Fame, uh, People's Republic of Desire, and most recently, uh, the film we're going to talk about today, uh, 76 Days, which is a uh, portrait of uh, an intensive care unit at a hospital in Wuhan in the earliest days of the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, just for some breaking news, the, we just learned yesterday uh, that the film has been shortlisted for an Academy Award for uh, Best Documentary Feature. So congratulations to Howe for that. And I should say, um, for the purposes of uh, this event, that I was also an International Security Program Fellow at New America, uh, as well as a 2015 National Fellow uh, with the New America Fellows Program. And uh, I have a lot of questions for how, but um, before we begin, uh, I think we just have a short clip from the film we were gonna play. Um, so, you know, from, from the point of view of a journalist, I mean, they, as that clip showed, uh, it's really incredible the kind of access you got uh, in this hospital. So um, I'm wondering if you could just start by talking about both how you connected with your two uh, collaborator, collaborators on this film and how they were able to get um, this incredible footage uh, from inside the kind of place that, you know, one, one year into a pandemic, uh, we very rarely see uh, in any country. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Josh, for moderating this, this talk. And also, it's great to be back to New America, even though just only virtually over Zoom. Um, I have very fond memories of being a fellow uh, over there. And uh, in terms of um, how the film came to, into being, um, in early February, I started researching this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this film. And I was in New York at that time. So, uh, um, so as soon as I started researching, I reached out to um, over a dozen filmmakers who had started filming in Wuhan and uh, just through introduction um, via fr uh, other friend, by other friends. And uh, some of them were obviously filming inside of hospitals, others were filming outside of the hospitals. Um, so I started talking to them and the very beginning is more like, uh, there's any way just been trying to build up trust. It's just like, how can we work? How can I support whatever you want to do uh, before I even say, okay, can we collaborate? And but um, I've uh, so I've, I've talked to over definitely over a dozen filmmakers, and then I found uh, found my two co eventual collaborator. As soon as I saw their footage, I was really blown away because um, by mid February, I had spent a lot of time reading um, about news reporter and also social media uh, accounts of uh, what's happening in Wuhan. In following that. Um, 
uh, you know, every every single day, closely monitoring the, the situation remotely. But then um, I had very so like little access to what's truly happening on on, on the front line, right? I mean, the, 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 these two collaborative footage really brought me there. Let me feel about the emotion, the raw, the fear, and the panic at the very beginning. And so so that's why I really focused on trying to talk, collaborate and talking to them and try to build up a trust to collaborate with them. During the lockdown in Wuhan, the access to hospital was really limited to um, only medical workers, patients, and reporters, and some state-sanctioned filming crews. Um, so for my two co-directors, uh, but at the same time, the decision-making is actually pretty, at least at the very beginning, during the initial chaos of the lockdown, and the decision-making of who to give access to, even for reporters, is being made at the hospital, very localized hospital level. So. For luckily for me, my two collaborators are both reporters. One of them, Wei Shi Chen, he's a video reporter for Esquire China. He wasn't sent by Esquire to cover the story because he's a he makes documentary films on the side. He's an aspiring filmmaker, so he just wanted to go. And uh, even for him, even though he has a reporter's badge, like he he can at least say I you know I want here to do some reporting. But in the beginning, he was turned down by four different hospitals until. To his own personal connection, he found uh, a medical team that was being sent from elsewhere in China to help support a local hospital. And then once he arrived in Wuhan uh, with the medical team, the receiving hospital considered him part of the medical team and allowed him in. So that's how he uh, gained access. And for my uh, co-director Anonymous, who he opted not to reveal his identity with, in this film, He's a photojournalist with a, a local state-owned newspaper. And um, uh, for, for him, he, or, he had already known a lot of the hospitals there and he had legitimate business to be there taking photos to accompany some of the uh, new, news stories. But then he decided to start making videos because he just felt like the photos alone uh, were not able uh, to capture the intensity on the front line. And, uh, and for, but but even for anonymous as a as a local um, local reporter, he wasn't able to get access to a couple of hospitals that were the hardest hit. For example, like you know uh, for uh, Wuhan Central Hospital, where Do Dr. Li Wenliang, who was one of the early whistleblowers, um, um, and uh, where he worked, and because a lot of medical staff got infected, so that hospital didn't allow any reporters to go in un un unless it's officially under official business to be there. Yeah, I mean, do you have any idea why the hospital that you did end up filming in uh, chose to participate in this film? Uh, why, why was that they uh, allowed you this level of access? Um, I, I think, first of all, in the very beginning of this uh, lockdown, because a lot of hospitals were running out of PPEs, so they were under, um, mm. they need medical supplies. Um, if you follow what, what happened during the lockdown in the first couple of weeks, the, some of the hospitals actually, um, you know, uh, went on social media in China, just appeal to people to donate goods there. So uh, so for some of the hospital, they have the incentive to really let reporters in to report what's truly happening. Um, and so they can get more support. Uh, secondly, um, like, we, for example, like the case with Wei Shi Chen and the hospital for a while uh, definitely thought Wei Shi was working uh, with the with the medical team arriving because, you know, the, the local hospital saw them arriving together, and as soon as the medical team arrived, the medical team kind of took over the management of the local hospital because uh, uh, the local hospital were overwhelmed, and 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 and. And then I guess a lot of times because they have reporter, they have reporter, so there's uh, some kind of uh, uh, sort of kind of trust. Uh, it's not just like any kind of independence rushing to the hospital. Um, but as soon as the reporter, my two collaborators, got inside the contamination zone, uh, because the, the 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 on the front line, the situation was so chaotic. Um, they were just like nobody had the time or energy to watch over the shoulder to make sure they don't film this and film that. So my collaborator, even both of them were filming independently just by themselves. They could pretty much roam free inside of the contamination zone. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's something that struck me. I mean, the when we think about China's response to this pandemic, uh, one thing that gets emphasized a lot, uh, both by critics and supporters, is you know how it's sort of orderly and um, you know, the, the level of planning that goes into this. But you know, the film really shows how chaotic and, and panicked, the, the, how much chaos and panic there was uh, in those early days in Wuhan. Is that something that you were like 
consciously trying to uh, depict in this film? Uh, absolutely. I think I think right now with, with China, uh, there are two prevailing narratives, right? One is about its early failure, about its suppression of whistleblowers, and also um, the early panic and, and the really, um, you know, drastic and uh, fast decision making about locking down not just Wuhan, actually the the surrounding cities as well. You, I mean, pretty much very soon afterwards is the entire province of Hubei was under lockdown. Um, so that's one narrative. Um, the second narrative um, is about how efficiently it put uh, and quickly put the outbreak under control. So in this film, uh, even though um, because for artistic reasons, we didn't include a lot of the social media, uh, you know, people sh you know, share on social media, a lot of the footage they capture on their phones uh, and about the, the absolute, even like worse chaos than what's been portrayed in the film in, in the city of Wuhan and in the early days of the lockdown. And, but then I, I feel like we, I needed to tell at least the em, emotionally true story about how fearful people were at the very beginning, how, uh, how, how scared they are about the, the unknown because there, there was so little was known at that time, how dangerous the virus was, as well as how life came back somewhat to normal, gradually the city gradually, you know, you know had, had its rebirth uh, later on, so that to 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 me is uh, to to all of all of us is very important to portray it accurately. Right, and uh, I'm curious what the response, if any, to this film that has been in China. I mean, it, as you mentioned, one of your uh, co-directors has chosen to remain anonymous, and uh, I'm curious both about uh, that decision and also, you know, what the. Uh, um, response has been uh, for how the Chinese virus response was portrayed in this film? Yeah, um, so so the film really came together doing editing. So doing mm -hmm. production because it was so chaotic um, on the front line. I mean, I will have frequent discussion with my collaborators about which character to, 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 to continue filming. And, and, I, and also I asked them to, uh, we actually did us, uh, quite a few interviews with not only volunteers, uh, but also with uh, uh, whistleblower doctors who, who were part of the group that initially really tried to get the message out, as well as some dissidents who are suing the government. Um, but in the end, we decided not to include any of that, primarily because those are, when we approached those characters, we were not able to capture really good observational footage, mm. right? What we call verite footage, and mostly uh, sit-down interview that, that really doesn't cut well with the rest of the film, which is so you know, just let the viewers observe. <clears throat> but but then doing editing, I mean, I, I told my, um, especially my co-director Anonymous is that we're not making a uh, political film and, and, you know, a political film because what we want, you know, what we wanted to do to really showcase how a specific Wuhan story can also be universal as well. Because I lived in, uh, I lived in New York. I was in touch with a lot of filmmakers in Madrid, in Milan, the hotspots, right, of COVID. So I keep on hearing the same story about the panic, about um, hospital run, overwhelmed hospitals running out of PPEs, and how people really step up and try to help each other living through this. So I told him that I was like, you you shouldn't be concerned. But I think um, because there's so much COVID has become such a geopolitical conflict point and um, not just the Trump administration at that time was really like blaming everything on China and also Chinese government in turn starting in March really really tried to clamp down a uh, tightly control any narrative um, you know about its um, COVID response so I think my co-director Anonymous just became really nervous he was not sure even if we even for this a political film, uh, for him, he was not sure whether the government, what the government would think about our portrayal of at least the early panic. And also, how about showing the tragedy? How about showing that the ending, maybe the ending wasn't like triumph, triumphant enough for the, for the government. So, so for him, he just like, because he only worked for state-owned media in his entire professional life, he's extremely concerned. Not, in addition to that, he also was concerned about increasing numbers of nationalistic internet trolls in China who just latch onto anything that portrays China in any neg negative light, they will, you know, launch personal attacks online. He's afraid that's going to impact his job as well. So that's why he decided to remain anonymous out of respect for his wish. So we, in the beginning, uh, when we, we 
launched the film at Toronto International Film Festival, we actually, since then, we've been declining all Chinese language media interviews. We just want to say, we want to observe how at least the Chinese diaspora uh, outside of China are perceiving this film. And then we will decide how much to, 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 to talk to Chinese language media. But, but then just very strangely, about a month ago, I think, um, le- maybe a month ago, because this film, uh, we are, MTV is marketing this film, doing this awards campaign. A lot of film trade me- and publications started talking about this as a potential award container. So there was one influencer in China that just picked up on this news. And, and then it started trending, went viral in China. It was also be- before the one year anniversary of the Wuhan lockdown. So, uh, so parody copies started popping up everywhere on Chinese internet. So people have been able to watch the film that way in China. Mostly I think Chinese viewers who watch the parody copies and their response has been really positive because it's a way, uh, th- this film to me is about collective grief, right? And the very end is about trying not to forget about the tragedy, trying to remember what went through. And also it's an elegy to, to some degree to the Wuhan lockdown. So uh, most Chinese viewers understood that. But then just as Anonymous had fear, the internet trolls started attacking me because without even watching the film, they say the fact that Western you know, market like this film, it's uh, evidence enough that the film is definitely biased. It's a ne- you know, very negative portrayal of China. They started attacking me personally. Anyway, it just become uh, kind of ironic. It's like, you know, you, you at least watch the film first. But I guess internet trolls are, are the same everywhere. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, to that point, I mean, the format of the film, you know, you, you don't have any narration, there's or, you know, direct interviews, there's very little text that appears on the screen. It's very, uh, as you said, verite style, it almost reminds me a little bit of Frederick Wiseman's documentaries. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm curious why you made the choice to film it that way. And uh, um, if that was in any way kind of anticipating some of uh, this response you were just talking about. Yeah, we didn't. Um, we started out wanting to making a more traditional documentary, right? We wanted to capture some variety, and also uh, because it was so difficult to do any sit down interview at that time because everybody was rushing around, right? And um, we were thinking after everything, you know, uh, kind of have gone back to normal, uh, has gone back to normal. We'll go back and do pick up interviews with them, right? Um, but then I think just doing and and but then a couple of things really emerged during production. Um, which was, it's really hard for us to focus, uh, f- for my collaborator to really keep track of one or a few main characters and follow their journey through, quote unquote, journey through this lockdown experience because things happen really quickly and then patients might deteriorate so bad they could not talk anymore or they may pass away or they may be get transferred to a different hospital. So. Doing production and doing editing at the early stage, I just realized I have all these wonderful emotional moments, you know, with a very raw moments on, you know, a, a lot of unflinching and portrayal of what's happening on the on the front line. But then, how do I put this film together? And and also, I've I've seen by that time I've seen enough of Chinese government produced documentaries where they sit they interview the, the the characters and somehow asking them to retell their experience uh, on camera kind of like diminishes the power of their experience, uh, which, you know, uh, has already been captured on, on camera. So, and, and so that's why I, in the end, I was just like, you, you mentioned Fred Weisman. So when we ran into the editing issue, we went back and watched a lot of other films for inspiration. And Fred Weisman was definitely one of the biggest in- influences. You know, maybe what we can do is just let people observe what's happening. Uh, on the front line, rather than trying to explain to them what this character is thinking or at which stage, um, you know, the uh, the lockdown, the out- Wuhan outbreak was at, and uh, we also experiment with cutting in some news uh, news clips to explain the the bigger context, to even talk about you know how the pandemic, how the outbreak was ex- expanding globally, becoming a pandemic, but in the end, it's also artistically just kind of take the viewers out of it. And uh, and then you know and then we just made a decision. Why don't we just go like Wiseman all the way very uh, 
um, you know, because we, we realized in the end, knowing many other filmmakers are also making COVID films and all, particularly all other COVID films about Wuhan as well. So I just feel like there's no single film can be the quote unquote authoritative account of what happened during the lockdown. And we can only provide one side of the story and we can tell that yeah, as long as we tell that story well, and that can be part of the composite um, later on people can use to, to, to really truly understand what happened. Yeah, another thing that really struck me in the film was the uh, relationship between the generations you show. I mean, obviously you had a year for a year, very young hospital staff and uh, mostly elderly patients, including uh, the, the one character, the grandfather, who, who kind of uh, appears throughout the film. Um, uh, I'm wondering if, the, if there was something you were trying to say about that, about the, um, um, the relationship between uh, the sort of younger generation and their elders uh, uh, in China and what the um, uh, pandemic has sort of re revealed about about that? Um, we didn't aim to comment on that uh, aspect, but I think if anything, it's more, it's just a reflection of the reality uh, that most of the patients are older, mi middle aged to seniors. And most of the medical staff, especially in nurses, because the government and had a volunteer call, right? Asking people to volunteer to go to Wuhan. And most of the people uh, who volunteer to go, go to Wuhan are younger, definitely younger. And, if, and, and there are some doctors who are middle-aged as well. But then I think for us, for um, my collaborator, it's just much easier to film the nurses uh, mm -hmm. because for the doctor, uh, you know, the, the, sometimes they will discuss very sensitive patients, uh, you know, medical record information, and they, they didn't want to be filmed. And, uh, but if anything, I think the film, you know, for us is more about how people build surrogate, uh, sort of like uh, surrogate families in, mm -hmm. a in, 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 in doing such a catastrophe, because the, the one of the cool things about COVID-19 is that it isolates people, isolates patients. Patients, a lot of times they feel alone and, yeah, and also when, when they need the, 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 their family the most for emotional support, they, they were not able to get that. And I think, um, you know, as soon as um, the, uh, the initial outbreak, the panic phase passed, um, you know, you see life kind of coming back to normal. You see them addressing each other as aunties and grandma and grandpa. And then you see this kind of a family relationship started forming, which, uh, which you know, it, there's some specific cultural things to it about China, but also I think everywhere based on the stories I've been hearing is the same thing happening in the New York ICUs as well. Right. Um, another thing, I mean, a, a lot of your, some, some, some of your earlier films, particularly um, uh, People's Republic of Desider, last one I saw, sort of dealt with internet culture and um, sort of changing ways people consume media and information. And this film is obviously very different, but there was a little bit of that in there. I mean, there was the sort of scene where the doctor tells the patient to stop searching Baidu for information. And, and then also the, the phones being a kind of um, motif, the record, like how people's, uh, the phones of the deceased patients uh, are sort of passed on to their relatives. Um, as uh, mementos, um, you, you know, I'm, I'm curious how you think uh, the sort of role of technology and um, uh, and the way people sort of consume information now um, uh, impacted the way that uh, patients were treated uh, during this pandemic. Yeah, I think the phone, social media played such a huge role in uh, during COVID especially initial outbreak in China. I remember I was in Shanghai when Wuhan was under, put under lockdown. I was there visiting my family. Um, some of the, you know, I just remember everybody glued to their phone during the Chinese New Year. Uh, the entire country of China was shut down. Everybody stayed home inside during the um, two, uh, 10 day holiday. Everybody was on social media trying to find out what was happening in Wuhan. So just for information, uh, access, I think social media uh, sometimes can play a much, you know, play a positive role, first of all, um, uh, about how we can get information more accurate, uncensored by the government. But at the same time, later on, 
obviously, like in the film, there's a lot of misinformation as well. And people love to share on social media about this miracle cure. And then, and, you know, they're, they're, they're being, um, during the lockdown, there have been, um, there have been unfounded fear of people who once contracted COVID, uh, you know, they, they can, the virus will come back uh, for, for those individuals. So many people were shunning um, patients even after they were released by the hospital in Wuhan as well. And, and also just in terms of how we keep in touch with each other, right? I mean, you see in the, um, for those who were lucky enough to have a phone, and most of them were, except for some very senior people, um, you know, that's how they keep in touch with each other. That's how they call people uh, from the outside to feel that connection. But also phone becomes when the head nurse was trying to save the personal effects for the relatives of the dead, two things they have to say. One is the ID card, because that might be useful for official reason, for their certificate, whatever reasons like that. But also the other thing is definitely phones, because phones, the last one, we keep our memory, uh, we keep our chats. Um, so yeah, um, it's uh, it's become such an integral part for for both good and bad. <laughs> Uh, we were talking a little bit before the conversation began um, about uh, obviously right now uh, the WHO investigation team is, has just left Wuhan and the story of Wuhan and the, the origins of the virus have become very politicized, uh, particularly in terms of the conflict between China and the U.S. Uh, I, I, I'm curious in, in that context, you know, what do you have hopes for like, what telling the story the way you did uh, can add to the conversation about uh, uh, and this kind of a uh, political moment around the beginnings of the pandemic? Absolutely. I, I think I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean, at the very beginning when I started researching this film, um, I think I, my feeling at that time, my motivation at the time was kind of similar to the va how the vast majority of Chinese people in China were feeling, which was uh, one of confusion, of anger, of about how you know, even after SARS, the, the mismanagement of SARS, how could we do this again? What happened in the very beginning? It was pretty investig. My intention at the very beginning was kind of investigative, but really quickly, I think um, uh, I just realized because Wuhan was under strict lockdown, it's really hard to move physically within the city. And secondly, um, you know, I couldn't, it's not, I could not get anything more than what's already been covered by news media at that time. Uh, and, and, and I think, yeah, so when, but later on, I think what really changed my point of view on this and also a lot of Chinese people's point of view on China's management or initial management of the, of the outbreak was um, how witnessing how other countries, most other developed democracies failed in their respective response. So I think that got a lot of us thinking um, through this as like, you know, why all political system fail um, in its initial response, dealing with some unknown. Um, so that's one thing. Secondly, I started reading a lot about past pandemics. Uh, it just feels like in anytime there's a, you know, Spanish flu, AIDS pandemic, and also the, the, the Black Death, every single time we, our knee-jerk reaction is to Scape, scapegoat someone because we want to blame other people for our own failures. And, uh, and one thing that really made me think a lot of was the book about AIDS pandemic and the band, and the band played on. That was a great book. It's basically mm -hmm. tracing how the whole society, not just the Reagan administration failed in effective com control, uh, controlling uh, AIDS at the very beginning. So, so all of that plays into my thinking is that right now, first of all, it's too early to draw any conclusive uh, conclusions about who did right or wrong. Uh, and then we need to have more data, uh, just as what WHO is trying to do right now, going to China to find data. So um, it's too early to, for me as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, to, to, to draw that. Um, at the same time, I'm, I'm feeling like this COVID pandemic has become too number driven about statistics and also political, uh, not just geopolitical on the international stage, but also domestically, it's become very too political. I, I think, you know, a lot of, we, 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 we tend to forget the, the individual human stories, the human sufferings and the human impact. Uh, so that's why as a storyteller, as, as a creative team, all of us made the decisions like, you know what, let's, somebody else has already made a film 
about the political commentary. Let's just focus on the hum humanity and the universal humanity uh, in, in, our, in our story. I mean, are there, uh, it's interesting watching the film now when you're into this sort of being plunged back into those early days where uh, we didn't really know uh, what this thing was and uh, did, didn't have a good understanding of it. And, uh, I, I'm curious with the benefit of, of hindsight one year into the pandemic, are there things you would have done differently uh, either in the uh, initial filming uh, or, in the, or in the editing of it, how you put it together? I, I'm really proud of what we've done with this film because we we had a lot of footage. We have over 300 hours of footage, but at the same time, a, a lot of the footage was uh, being spread out over uh, many different characters, and so it's really hard to for us to use. Um, so so looking back, I I I don't know. I I just feel like. Um, in terms of uh, filming, obviously, if I had known how chaotic the situation would be, I would, you know, have a much better discussion in terms of if we had had a planning process to 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 urge them to, um, you know, to focus on certain characters more. Um, but looking back, I think I, I think I think my my personal takeaway, looking back on what happened during the lockdown, was was the realizations that. You know, my because at the very beginning of the lockdown, I together with many other Chinese, we were criticizing the government's response. To be honest, is that too drastic? You know, you announce that there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, human sacrifice during the lockdown because we were were trying to get in touch with people um, who were who would can you know like AIDS patients, right? They couldn't even get their doing the because of the lockdown, AIDS patients are not getting getting the AIDS medication. And there, there are cancer patients who could, could not get their chemo, so their cancer spread. So there are many, many sad stories because of the lockdown. So in the beginning, when even when we were were doing production of the film, I wanted to capture those stories because I thought that what the government did was wrong in many ways. But now looking back so it, I have so many other questions I don't have clear answers to is that maybe this type of really almost draconian measures was how China could emerge really quickly out of this. Um, yeah, so I, I just feel like looking back, it just, I still have, you know, many, many questions. I'm still continuing to think about those questions. Did you know going in uh, or you know from early on uh, which who are who are going to be the main characters uh, in the film? Uh, you know, I guess you focused on on the head nurse uh, Yang Li and on uh, Tian from Shanghai, and uh, you know the the couple uh, with the baby. I mean, did did you know early on that those were sort of threads you were going to follow through the film, or did that emerge more organically? I definitely emerge more organically. I think the and the during production, I think the only one we know for sure is the old grandpa because he always wanders in the hallway. So my co-director, Wei Shi Chen, always have to help to, you know, um, uh, guide him back into his sick room. So he had a lot of interaction with him. He filmed a lot of him. We have enough footage. With the others, and when, when the footage was coming in, we had no idea out of the, you know, dozens and dozens of characters who might be the main characters. But then as we, I think it's like in, almost in like in mid-March, like almost, uh, uh, approaching the end of the lockdown uh, at that stage, when I suddenly realized, wait, 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 let's go back, you know, um, to, 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 to follow. Because my, uh, my co-director, I follow not just one couple who are delivering a baby. I mean, there's obvious, there are other couples as well for, for their new story. But then, uh, uh, you know, um, I just said, can you go back and to find one of the, one of the couple to, to really follow to see how they can reunite with the baby. And with, with Yang Li, it's actually, we didn't know um, she could be a main character until we know she was determined to return the personal effects to the family. When she started cleaning them all over again after the initial, uh, the initial scene where we saw her. So, so I think uh, approaching the end, I did in, tell my uh, co-director to encourage them to really to follow through. But that's almost already like in the process, almost approaching the end of the production, where we're scratching our heads and like, who can be our main character? How can we build build a story around characters? Right. Uh, I just want to encourage the audience uh, to uh, uh, 
if you have questions for how, uh, feel free, I can uh, pass those along from him. And I'll, I'll take one from the audience now, which is, uh, you know, uh, having had experience in both Chinese and US culture, uh, how do you think this film might have been different if you had made a companion film with the same methods in a uh, New York hospital at the at the height of the pandemic? Oh God, I tried. I mean, for a while, I thought oh, we could make a um, a film about a tale of two cities because uh, I was in New York when the pandemic hit. Exactly the same story. Uh, you know, the, the early shortage of PPEs, overwhelmed hospitals, and volunteers, and trying to help those people lock, lock inside of their apartments. Um, so I, I I I filmed. I went out on the street and filmed in New York. I, I tried to. Uh, gain access to the hospitals, but uh, I, I think in some bizarre, ironic way, it's almost you know even more difficult to gain access to the hospital in New York as compared to Wuhan. Um, and, but I did know like two filmmaking team were filming inside the hospital because they're, they're, they were doing some other unrelated project prior to COVID started. And I also know one of the filmmaker who watched 76 Days, he said, that's exactly how he's making that film in New York City because he found in 76 is so much common humanity. That's, a, that's this, also the same sentiment, the same, you know, like for him, the same creative impulse as well as we, as he was trying to capture like the human stories on the front line as people were dying in New York. Right. So it's, it's, got, it's got to come out this year. Uh, this is sort of an, an advice question, but it, it seems that uh, you were able to turn your isolation into a positive uh, by making this film. Uh, do you have any advice uh, for how people can create good work uh, when everything is so difficult right now in our current uh, state of isolation? I don't know whether I can give any advice because right now I'm stuck in New York. I want to start a new project and I cannot travel. Um, I, I don't know if, if anything, this film really taught me to collaborate, right? To work with, uh, to find collaborators that, uh, that whose creative style and vision are in sync with yours and try to work together. And that's the only advice. I mean, I feel so extremely fortunate I was able to work on this film um, last year because there's so much happening, not just COVID, Black Lives Matter, Trump administration. I, I just feel like the world the world was in chaos and working on this film almost like a therapy for me. Every day I can I can continue to, to, to be able to focus on something. So yeah, I mean, but right now I'm once again I'm I'm struggling with having to find something to to to, to latch on to to uh, but but then yeah the only thing is that to collaborate to collaborate and to find something you truly truly believe in because in this chaotic time it's so it's so easy to get distracted but then work on something that moves you daily like for me when i was editing the film literally i was crying every day um when i was working especially the first month when i was putting the film together yeah have you been able to share the film with uh uh with the nurses with the with the people who uh you filmed have they been able uh, to see them, you? Uh, my co-director had been able to share with some of them because uh, other people is once they're released in the hospital, not, you know, it's not easy to keep track of everything, but definitely the nurses, because, um, you know, uh, they're the main characters. Uh, I'm curious what, what, if you've gotten any interesting reactions from them of uh, seeing that, uh, that experience that they had uh, portrayed on film this way? Uh, for, for example, like the, the nurse who rushed down the hallway crying Papa in the beginning, it's still hard for her. She's she's still trying to. She's still recovering from the trauma. Um, so I think she watched parts of the film. It's really hard for, for her to watch the entire film. And uh, for the other two, they feel really proud. Um, the Yang Li and the Tian. They were. It, this film almost like a. It's almost like a personal, um, you know, record right of their experience in Wuhan, and. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of the med medical workers uh, were really appreciative of the of them being actually being captured, uh, their work being captured on on, on video. Uh, you said that this film is a departure from uh, previous ones that you've made. Uh, what do you think was the biggest learning obstacle you had in uh, uh, in doing a, a new kind of project like this? I, I think every project, every project can be a big challenge, right? Uh, even if 
uh, even we use the same style. But with this one, with my past work, I've done more traditional documentary um, and then sci-fi black mirrorish with a lot of animation graphics in People's Republic Desire, very personal film, all in my family. And with this one, it's really going back to the root of documentary filmmaking, which is pure traditional verite. Um, it was a big challenge, uh, obviously, to figure out how to, how to do this. Um, but it's also so much fun to be able to try something, try something different, to know that uh, I don't have to exp explain everything for a documentary. You don't have to explain everything to the viewers. And you can just take the viewers on the journey and for viewers to experience things, to feel things. And later on, if they're curious to search online, and find out more background information about the lockdown, about Wuhan, about what the government did right or wrong. We, we've talked a little bit about the challenges of getting this access, but I, I'm also just curious of the logistics of filming in that. I mean, the film shows the, uh, uh, the procedures that the doctors and nurses have to go through uh, for hygiene and, and wearing the big suits and, uh, um, uh, and keeping themselves safe. Uh, you know, what just sort of, you know, operating a camera in that environment, uh, well, what are some of the challenges uh, your collaborators faced? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a physically very demanding uh, filming environment because my collaborators, they, they have to down the multiple layers of PPEs and goggles and everything. And so, and also they have to tape up, right, all the openings. So the, basically mm -hmm. it's really hard to breathe. And just like in the film, a lot of times you see medical work, they have to sit down on the benches or even lie down to catch their breath. That's the same thing happened to my collaborator. And in, in the very beginning, there's also immense fear about catching the virus. So uh, they're really scared operating inside the contamination zone. And, uh, but later on, I think um, the, the bigger challenge is actually their mental anguish the trauma of watching people are really like deteriorating in front of their eyes or you know, and dying in front of their eyes and at the same time feeling extremely helpless. You know, that they're, that they're filming. I mean, my collab both collaborator co-directors have said multiple times to me, they wish they were, they could be like the nurses actually to help someone, but they were there, but then they could only be, you know, behind their camera. Um, so, yeah, so I, I mean, I, all I could do is really to sometimes encourage them to take a day off. And, but also, I, I also encourage them to, to, to tell them what they were doing has meaning. So you got that documented history. And, and so, so that part is already challenging. And also the way we collaborate was because they couldn't take the machines, the camera, because they were using a very small camera, first of all. They cannot use big cameras in those rooms. Um, and they would take their disk out every day because the disk you know, uh, every day to upload it onto the cloud and then I would download mm -hmm. it. So thank goodness they were not shooting in 4K, they only shooting HD. If they shoot in 4K, then it's gonna be almost impossible. It's gonna be take me weeks to download the, the rushes on a daily basis. Right, I mean, it, it, you'd really got some shockingly painful and personal moments uh, for some of these patients uh, uh, committed to film. I mean, it's starting from, the uh, very first scene of the movie, which is uh, one of the more wrenching uh, scenes you captured. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm curious how you thought about that. I mean, the, um, the sort of importance of getting, of sort of depicting uh, how painful this experience was versus uh, sort of, you know, respecting the, the privacy and uh, the boundaries of some of the people who, who you were filming. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, first of all, because my collaborators couldn't bring in pen and paper inside the contamination zone, we couldn't ask people to sign official, like quote unquote, the more formal release. And what we did was getting people to verbally agree for everybody who 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 they talked to, who talk, who had this, you know, who speak, who talk in front of our camera to get our consent. And and with regard to some of the other patients who are, you know, um, who basically are unconscious, uh, I think. It, we 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 went through a lot of debate around the ethical issues about depicting that. Um, I think in the end, we definitely try to be as far or 
filming the angle, at least the 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 in, you know the breathing tubes or the intubators at least blocking partially their face or and and we film at a distance to, sh to, to, to show respect. But at the same time, we kind of don't want to look away from this uh, because in some ways, I know it's a very cliche expression that in some ways, at least for my co-directors, they, 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 they felt they were inside a war zone. And then we just want to show the, the brutality and especially in the beginning of this, we didn't really, we didn't want the camera to look away. And we kind of, we, we kind of want to remind viewers of this. I think part of the reason, uh, maybe I don't know how big a reason that uh, a big part of the United States still refuse to believe that COVID-19 is real. I don't know whether it has anything to do with uh, the lack of visual evidence of the horror um, in, in, you know, in our media or not. Um, but at least in China, everybody took this very seriously, obviously because China has been hit with uh, flu-like outbreaks so many times, including SARS before. And secondly, it was uh, once the government decided to take this seriously, there's nonstop you know, news coverage of inside the hospitals and stuff like that. So I think people got it. So for us, it's like how to find the balance uh, of respecting people and at the same time to do accurate documentation, also portrayal, of what's truly happening on the front line. There are a couple of uh, great little, um, I guess you would say cultural touches that um, uh, that I only sort of picked up on uh, partly once the, um, the, the nurses writing the uh, foods they like on their PPE. Um, I guess I only figured out partway through the film that uh, Tian, one of the main nurses you followed, like came in from Shanghai, that he was um, sort of a, outsider in Wuhan. I, I'm curious that there are other things that uh, um, nuances that you think non-Chinese uh, or non-Chinese speaking uh, viewers uh, might have missed that uh, uh, you might want to draw, draw people's attention to um, either before or after they've watched the film? Yeah, I, I think the only thing viewers, it will help the viewer to, to, to realize that for the uh, everybody actually had their names written on their back. But then we decided to only ID to call out the names of two nurses because those are our main, uh, main characters. Uh, so for me, for any Chinese viewer, they would be able to tell, to track, much easier for them to track uh, characters from scene to scene. But for, the, for a non-Chinese character, it become almost impossible. But also we don't want to ID people just because they have a name written on the back if that character on, only appears once. It could be very distracting to the viewers. Uh, so other than that, I, I feel like this film intentionally, we, we definitely would love some, some touches, uh, some details, specific detail about this story being happening in Wuhan. And this is a, you know, happening in China there. But, other places, we we kind of thought it doesn't matter whether people pick up the cultural specific cultural detail on, uh, details or not, because we really want to showcase the universal universality of at least the the story we've captured on our cameras, and to to show that aspect. So that's why we didn't intentionally call anything, and that uh, that viewers might miss uh, about this. And um, I mean. There are some specific details. For example, the fact that Tian arrived from Shanghai, uh, he wasn't local, and uh, and we, you know, let viewers know, like almost approaching the end of the film, we didn't reveal that at the beginning, um, and uh, um, also, you know, like um, uh, a lot of the people, there's a lot of misunderstandings because a lot of the people arriving from outside one, they couldn't understand the local dialect. So I guess for viewers, you could still pick, pick them out, but then I, I guess for some other viewers, they might miss it, they might get really confused. Uh, but I think um, with this film, we decided not to make a big deal out of it because there's just so much, so much twists and turns during the lockdown. And uh, we just don't want to call out too many details that might distract people from you know, get understanding the emotional journey in, in, in the story. Yeah, I mean, for viewers who haven't seen it, I mean, one of the very distinct uh, visual aspects of this film is, you know, not only are the main characters wearing masks, but they're wearing, you know, full body suit PPE. And so you really can't see people's faces or 
identifying uh, Marx at all. And it's really remarkable how you do in the end have sort of distinct characters you're following, despite um, the fact that you, you can't really um, see what anyone looks like through, uh, you know, 90% of the film. Yep. Uh, related, a related question to that from an audience member is, uh, you talked about the film trying to depict the kind of universal humanity, um, whereas most Chinese audiences might see this as depicting a specifically Chinese context. Uh, and is that something you think about, uh, i.e., how do you avoid falling into the trap of getting accused of Western bias, as you mentioned, from social media trolls? Uh, or is that something that you're not really worried about, is that you not see as uh, sort of crucial to your documentary practice? Um, that's something I'm increasingly, I've increasingly paying less and less attention to, uh, because I, I feel like as a, as a storyteller, um, I think I, I need to pay more attention to my crafts, to how I can tell the story better, to how to move my audience more, rather than um, think too much about how I'm positioned in this film, whether I'm positioned for a Chinese audience or a Western audience. Um, um, because I just feel, I mean, obviously every filmmaker or storyteller has a different take on this. My personal take is that, you know, the, the, the less you, um, you make the story specific about one place, the more universal it can be. That's my hope, you know, with my body of work and limited body of work, you can see the, with my later films, I talk about China trying to explain the context less and less. I just want people to focus on the human story. And obviously, 76 Days is still very much Chinese story, right? Very Chinese. The relationship the patients and, uh, um, uh, and, and the medical worker have is very Chinese. The aunties and grandma, the, the, the easy, easiness to have this kind of um, um, surrogate family type like relationship. That's very Chinese. And also the, 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 the son talking to the father, like you're a communist party member. Can you just hold yourself, put, put yourself together and act like a party member, right? Be a model for other people. These are very Chinese, but then there are certain things that's deeper. That's about how humans wanting to connect with each other, how humans are willing to help each other making decisions. That's also universal. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that. That's one thing, uh, being an American watching the film is very striking, is the relationship between uh, the nurses and the patients. It's both they're, they're willing to be like a lot more stern with the patients and, and almost yelling at them. And, and um, uh, but also, as you mentioned, that this kind of, uh, a kind of warmth, calling the auntie and grandma, you know, a lot about sharing of food. And uh, I'm curious, is that almost like family, uh, both the positive and negative relationships of uh, aspects of family relationships. Is that um, sort of typical of a uh, of Chinese medical culture or is that something that like developed uh, during COVID specifically? I, I think it's more specific to COVID and, or let's put it that way, during times of crisis. Mm. Uh, I think um, the during normal time pre-COVID, pre there's actually increased in tension between the healthcare industry in China and uh, the, the patient population, because it's become really expensive um, to 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 get healthcare in China, and uh, the patient, and also because the the, the system is so strained, uh, it had very limited resources. So a lot of patients are complaining; they paid a lot of money not getting um, quality care. And then there has been increasing inc instances of uh, uh, violent violences um, targeted at you know, medical workers in China. But with COVID, I guess I, it's different um, in, for a couple of different, uh, for, for a number of reasons. One is I, I do feel like um, in times of crisis, we do step up. Like in China, that happened during, every time there's a flood or every time there's an earthquake uh, in 2008. So I think there are people are willing to step up. And, um, and, and the second thing is, the government pay for everything. Nobody was paying any money to get treated anywhere. Everything's been paid for. So the patients had no, no reason for you know for complaints. And also they are they even though they are they, they are being kind of forced, 
quarantine inside hospitals or hotels or quarantine centers. But at least because in the early days of the pandemic, they are really appreciative. They could get away from their family so they don't infect their friends and relatives, right? So that's, a, that's another thing. And um, yeah, I think um, for these um, different reasons, I think this is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of came as almost like a surprise to me as well because I, I, I took my parents to hospitals in China in Shanghai, even in Shanghai, it was really challenging dealing with overworked uh, uh, medical workers. But in this film, you know, it's just like the, the, the human emotion come out so beautiful. Right. Um, a question about your background. I mean, we touched about your career before uh, transitioning to filmmaking. Uh, do you think your background, either studying science or working in technology, has uh, influenced your style as a filmmaker? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I wish I could have started doing this a lot sooner. Um, but I think all my life experience, my professional experience, did help shape my worldviews and how I appro approach an issue. For example, like, I don't believe in easy answers um, because I started science, right? Science are always like, asking questions and, you know, and, and doubt. Uh, I have the tendency to doubt any easy answers, uh, first of all. So I always want to see the other side and to see the complexity in things. And uh, yeah, I, I think in all my films, uh, even though I, in the beginning of making 76 Day, I thought I'm making, I'm, I, I pick a very newsy topic this time, which, which is a big departure from my past film. But in the end, uh, you know, it came down to the human beings, right? The, the you know, my, uh, and also, I intentionally move away from some of their sort of like easy approach to looking at this issue, to, to go back to the human beings, uh, the human stories, to, to, to try to encourage people to think about the complexity of the Wuhan lockdown rather than say, oh, they did a great job. Oh, they did a horrible job. Right. And uh, last kind of broad question. Um, what do you think is going to be the lasting impact of this pandemic on China? And you can take that either, uh, um, you know, in terms of society, how people uh, um, relate to each other, or politically. Uh, let you take that, take that how you want. Oh, God, that's such a big, one, big. One. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a commentator, and I, I don't think I'm equipped to, to comment directly on that. I. I just have a couple of worries, right? Obviously, one worry is no matter how horrible the catastrophe is, we human beings, not just in China, here as well, we tend to forget it. We tend to forget any lesson we can draw from, from that. And uh, yeah, so that's what happened with, after SARS. That's what happened after the Spanish flu, right? After a few couple of years after that, we had the go-go 20s. Everybody was just partying and making money. And uh, I don't know, I'm more worried about we forget about this, we don't learn enough from this because another pandemic is definitely coming, right? It's definitely coming just because global warming and also human activities encroach, encroaching on wildlife habitat, that's definitely gonna come back. So I don't know whether we can learn a big lesson after this to learn to work with each other to really not just China, not just US, not just China, every country trying to learn from each other's best practices and sit down and use this as a common interest to have a dialogue. That's the thing I worry about most because it's so easy to going back to say, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, my system is superior or, or your system is draconian, is inhumane. But then, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm not saying those conversations are not, uh, and, and not worthwhile having that absolutely legitimate topic to discuss. But at the same time, let's not forget, we do have several common enemy, not just the pandemic, but also global warming as well, how we can work together. That's, that's the thing that worries me the most. And uh, a few people had a more specific question about where they can watch the film if they weren't able to before the event. Uh, and the first part of that I know is which they have a link in their New America RSVP email, which will work until midnight tonight. But afterwards, uh, where, where can people see this remarkable film? They can go to our official website, 76daysfilm.com. 
and uh, we have information about how to watch the film um, on the website. I mean, right now we're still doing the virtual cinema um, screenings throughout the country. So you can pick any virtual cinema you wanted to support and basically rent a movie from the virtual cinema. Well, fantastic. Well, I want to thank Hao again for joining us today. And uh, if you haven't already watched the movie before uh, this event, I really urge you to. Um, it's a it's a really unique uh, portrait of a historic moment and uh, the kind we very rarely get to see. Uh, and so uh, congratulations, Hao, and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Great talking to you. All right, take care. You too.